Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Praise King Jesus. Well, friends, it is such a blessing to be back with you. And in today's video, we are going to continue in our study in the book, Love Not the World. Now, I know that we have some new subscribers. And so if you're new, uh, what we've done is we began a series. If you'll go back to our playlist on YouTube, you'll see a series entitled The Road to Calvary. Then you'll see Humility. And then you'll see love not the world. And it's important if you're just joining us that you establish a good foundation. So I would strongly encourage you to watch the Road to Calvary series, then the Humility series, and then join us in love not the world. Because it creates a foundation that brings you to a point where you're ready to receive the truth that is established in the book, Love Not the World. And this book, of course, is by Watchman Nee. So today we're in chapter 8, and it's titled Mutual Refreshing. So let's begin together. Mutual Refreshing, chapter 8 of Love Not the World. In John's gospel, there is recorded an event which only he has preserved for us. It is an event full of divine meaning and one which greatly helps to illumine for us the problem of living in the world. I refer to the incident in chapter 13 of John in which our Lord Jesus girds himself with a towel and taking a basin washes his disciples' feet. This action of Jesus has lessons to teach us which I do not propose to go into fully here. Instead, I want us to look at his command which follows it. When Jesus said, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now again, you can find this in John chapter 13 and verses 14 through 17. What is this mutual feet washing? What does it mean that I should wash my brother's feet and that my feet should be washed by my brother. The aspect of truth specially emphasized here is refreshment. As we shall shortly see, it is something very dear to the Lord that we as his children should learn to minister refreshment to our brethren, and that they in turn should be a means of refreshment to our spirits. Let me say at once that this passage does not concern sins. Whether I go barefoot or wear sandals or even shoes, the dust that gathers on my feet is something inevitable. I cannot avoid it. But for me to have a fall, to roll in the dust so that it collects on my body and on my clothes, that is not inevitable. It is altogether wrong. I have to walk from one place to another, but it is quite unnecessary for me to roll along the street in order to get there. I can do so without floundering in the mud. Equally, in the Christian life, to stumble and fall and then to flounder in the dust is sin, certainly. It calls for repentance, and it needs God's forgiveness. For it is not necessary for me to walk with the Lord like that, hiding behind the excuse that I must fall once in a while. It is inevitable. That, we all agree, is wrong. But the point about the dust on our feet is this, that in walking through the world, no matter who we are or how careful we may be, it is inevitable that our feet will collect something. Now let me read that again and keep in mind the reference that Watchman Nee is using with the dirt being sin. And so relate as we read this again, our lives as we walk through this world inevitably collecting sin, no matter how careful we are. Watchman Nee again says, 
in walking through the world, no matter who we are or how careful we may be, it is inevitable that our feet or our lives will collect something. Of course, we do not touch the earth at all. We certainly pick up nothing. But to achieve this, we should have to be carried around. If we do touch the ground, and who seriously expects not to, we are certain to pick up what is there. Even our Lord Jesus rebuked his host with the words, Thou gavest me no water for my feet. You'll read about this in Luke chapter 7, verse 44. So please remember, brother and sister, that the mutual washing spoken of in John 13 is not concerned with sins committed, for which there is always forgiveness through the blood of Christ, but from which anyway God intends that we should be delivered. No, it is concerned rather with our daily walk through the world, during which it is unavoidable that we shall contract something. You are clean, Jesus says. The precious blood of Christ sees to that. He that is bathed needeth not. That's what Jesus said to Peter when Jesus said, Wash all of me. And as far as sin is concerned, the sentence might end there. But move about Satan's kingdom, and something certainly clings to us. Like a film upon us, it comes between us and our Lord. This is inescapable, simply because we are touching the world's things all the time. It's business and its pleasures, its corrupt scale of values, and its whole ungodly outlook. Hence the words which Jesus concludes, save to wash his feet. So let us come now to the practical outworking of this. Some of you brothers and sisters in Christ have to go out to work in offices or other places of businesses for, say, seven or eight hours a day. It is not wrong that you do so. It is not sin to work in a shop or a factory. But when you come home from your place of employment, do you not find yourself tired and dispirited and out of tune with things? You meet a brother but you cannot slip easily and directly into speaking with him of divine things. It is though there were a coating of something contaminating you. I repeat, that is not necessarily sin at all. It is just that your contact with this world has deposited upon you that film of tarnish. You cannot help feeling it. For there seems to be an inability to rise up to the Lord at once. The luminous touch which you had with him in the morning seems to have been darkened. Its freshness has gone from you. We all know that experience. Or again, some of our sisters have to attend to domestic duties. Let us suppose a young mother is preparing dinner and has something cooking on the stove. All at once the baby cries, the doorbell rings, the milk boils over, everything comes upon her in a rush. She runs to one and misses another. After everything is eventually settled, she sits down, and it seems as if she needs a power to lift her up to God again. She is conscious of something there, not sin, but as it were, a deposit of dust over everything. It clings like a film coming between her and her Lord, and she feels tarnished, soiled. There is not that clear way which takes her through to God at once. This, I think, illustrates for us the need of feet washing. Many a time we are tired and jaded by our secular duties, when we get down to pray, we find we have to wait for a while. It seems to take us 10 or 20 minutes to come back to that place where we can really get through to God. Or if we sit down to read the Word, we find it requires a determined effort to restore again that openness to His speaking. But how good it is if on the road home we meet a brother with an overflowing heart, fresh from communion with God. 
without meaning to do anything, he just spontaneously shakes our hand and says, brother, praise the Lord. He may not know it, but somehow it is as if he has come with a duster and wiped everything clean. Immediately, we feel that our touch with God has been restored. Sometimes you may come into a prayer meeting with a spirit heavy through the effect of your work during the day. Someone may pray, and you still feel the same. And another prays, and yet there is no difference. But then another brother or sister prays, and somehow you immediately feel the lifting power. You are refreshed. Your feet have been washed. What then does washing mean? It means to restore to the original freshness. It means to bring things back to a point of such clarity that it is once again as though they came out of God's immediate presence, new from his hand. I do not know how many times I personally have felt low like that, when it was not exactly sin that was troubling, but that feeling of a coating of the world's dust. And then I have met a brother or sister, one who may have known nothing at all of my condition, but who has just passed on a remark that has brightened everything. When this happens, you simply feel all the darkness gone. The film swept away. Praise God, you are refreshed and put back at once into the condition where you can directly enjoy touch with him again. That is feet washing, to refresh my brethren in Christ, to bring a brother again to the place where it is as though he had just come out from the very presence of God. It is this ministry to one another that the Lord desires to see among his children. If we are walking with God, there is not a day when we may not, if we wish, be a refreshment to our brethren. This is one of the greatest ministries. It may be no more than a handshake. It may be a word of encouragement almost casually spoken. It may be just the light of heaven on our faces. But if the Lord has his way with us, and we are in the state of having no cloud between ourselves and him, we shall find that we are quietly being used. We may not know it, for it is better not to know it. Indeed, it may be better never to know it. But whether we know it or not, we are constantly being used to refresh our brother. When he is low and in darkness, when he has a burden on his heart, or a film before his eyes, when he has been tarnished and stained, then to us he will come. He may not stay long, perhaps only for a few minutes. Seek for that ministry, brother. Seek for that ministry, sister. Find grace from God to help your brother or sister in need. Often we think it would be good if we could give long sermons that command a wide hearing. But few have that gift, and many are not reached by those few who have it. To refresh the hearts of the saints is the kind of ministry which everyone can fulfill and which can reach everywhere. In the valuation of God, it is priceless. But to serve others in this way, we must fulfill the conditions. If we are really going on with the Lord, there is, of course, no question that we shall be used, for there are no limitations with him. If we ourselves are untarnished, with hearts brimming with his joy and peace, there is bound to be an overflow. So the simple question I put to you is this, is there any point of controversy between you and God? I refer, of course, to real known issues. If there is nothing special, then there is no need for you to search around to find something. The Lord himself will always discover it. When he wants to bring to light something you are overlooking, he will always point his finger there, and you will know it. There is no need for you to turn your eyes within and by checking up 
and analyzing every feeling to try to dig it out. Just praise him. It is the Lord's business, not yours, to shine into your heart and show you when you are astray from him. But one thing is certain. If you do have a controversy with God, you can only tarnish others. You can never wash their feet. When they are low, you will bring them lower. When they feel heavy, you will come to them and make them heavier still. Instead of refreshing them and restoring to them the newness that comes out from God, you can only plunge them into deeper gloom. To be at odds with God is the sure way to be a drain upon the life of his people. Whereas the greatest manifestation of power is, I believe, to be able constantly to refresh others. It is a priceless thing. That touch of heaven that lifts, cleanses, and renews. You also ought to wash one another's feet. Again, the words of Jesus. And of all his commandments to his disciples, this is, and I use the expression in its purest sense, the most dramatic. To impress on them its importance, he himself acted it out before them. It was an expression of his love for his own which were in the world. He set himself to show his disciples what he meant by ministry. It is not platform work. It is serving one another with a basin and a towel. There will always be a need of restoring people who have fallen, of bringing them afresh to what is original and of God. That is power. Jesus himself came forth from God to do this. I do not know how this strikes you, but I think there is no greater power for God than to be fresh from him before the world. Do you not find it to be the greatest manifestation of the power of divine life? In a world system darkened with the smoke of the pit, how we rejoice to meet saints who are fresh with the clean air of heaven. Such freshness brings anew to you and me the divine breath of life. I thank the Lord Jesus that in my younger days I had the great privilege of knowing one of the rarest of saints. I knew her for many years and found her to have many spiritual qualities, but I think the thing that impressed me above them all was the sense of God about her. You cannot for long sit in her presence or even walk into her room and have a handshake without feeling a sense of God coming over you. You did not know why, but you felt it. I was not the only one who felt this. Everyone who had touched her gave the same testimony. I have to confess that in those days, many a time, I was feeling downhearted, and it seemed as though everything had gone wrong. I walked into her room, and immediately I felt rebuked. Immediately, I felt that I was face to face with God. I was refreshed. Why would this thing happen, this immediate restoration? Surely not because it is the ministry of just a privileged few. The Lord would like every single one of us to be like that, to impart that power to brighten our brothers and sisters when they have become tarnished. Please remember, dare I say this, that sometimes being tarnished does more to hurt the impact of the Christian's life upon the world than do his actual conscience sins. Once in a while, we may sin, any of us, but because we are sensitive to that sin, we know at once that we have done so and will seek and find forgiveness. But many a time, we have been tarnished for hours with the world's tarnish, and because it is not actual sin, we remain unconcerned. Then it is that our impact for God upon the world becomes blunted. How good it is at such a time to have around a brother or sister 
through whom we are lifted once more to a renewed communion with God. What then are the rules? They are two. First, as we have seen, there must be no known discord between me and the Lord that is not at once cleared up. For if there is, that effectively puts me out of this ministry altogether. Whatever the matter be, it is to be settled at once or I am useless. Far from being an asset to the church of God, I have become only a burden. I can contribute nothing. I can only add to the debit side of the life of his children. In order to be a contributor, there must be a transparent clearness between me and God on every conscious issue. Then, free of such disharmony, I too may be the means of lifting my brethren back to their place of power against the world. The second rule, and to avoid misunderstanding, this needs to be stated plainly, please remember that this refreshment is mutual. Jesus said, wash one another's feet, one another's feet. The refresher must expect also to be refreshed by others. Many a time the Lord may use you, but equally, many a time, he may use someone else to refresh you. There exist no chosen few set apart for a spiritual task as refreshers. Just as none of us are absolved from walking through this world and not needing, therefore, to be refreshed. As with Peter, no single one of us is entitled to say of himself, I have gone beyond that stage. I am now in such touch with God that I am above tarnish and can pray or preach without the need of such a ministry. Thou shalt never wash my feet. In the church, in the body of believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, there exists no superior class of brothers who have no need to be refreshed. It is something every servant of God depends upon. Employed in a workshop or a kitchen all day, you may well need brightening up. But some of us have been working all day in churches, and yet still we too need to be brightened. Our need of restoration is often just as great, though we may well be lulled into overlooking that fact. Whether we work in an obviously secular sphere or we're engaged in so-called spiritual things. The world is all around us, closing in and ever-present. Ever and anon, therefore, we need the help of some brother or sister to lift us again to that fresh touch of God, that renewal of divine power. Thus, the principle of the body of Christ is quite simply refreshing and being refreshed. The more we go on with the Lord, the more we need the brethren. For in this ministry, not one of us is insignificant, and not one of us ever reaches the point where we have no need to be ministered to by another. My prayer for myself is that God may once in a while use me to refresh someone else's spirit when it is jaded and that likewise he may once in a while use someone else to touch my flagging spirit and refresh me. If by that brother the tarnish of the world is wiped off me, so that coming weary I go away renewed, then his has been a ministry of Christ to me. What I have thus sought to describe in simple terms amounts to a united front against the world in which we live. This is no small thing. If we will believe it enough to practice it, it possesses, I am convinced, the power to make Satan's mightiest strongholds tremble. In Jesus' words, in John thirteen seventeen, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 
And that brings us to the end of chapter eight today, friends. And I, I trust that you've been blessed and challenged as Watchman Nee has reminded us of these oh so ever important words of the Lord Jesus in how we're always to be a vessel that can be used by him to touch the lives of others. And as we close, and I'm surprised that Watchman Nee did not use this passage to support what he has presented to us, we are told in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, beginning at verse 29, let no corrupt, now that word corrupt in the Greek means worthless. It could also mean degrading. And even more, it could mean idle. So let no corrupt communication, let no degrading communication, let no worthless corrupt communication. By worthless, he means it, something that does not benefit another. It has no use. Let no worthless communication, no idle communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, in the King James Version, there's a comma there because the thought is going to continue. And I will read that to you in a moment. But there should be an exclamation point because it is a statement. Let no worthless, idle, degrading, corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But then Paul continues and says, but let only proceed out of your mouth that which is good, beneficial to the use of edifying, lifting up, restoring the one who is listening to what it is you have to say, and that what you have to say may minister grace unto the hearers. And by doing so, in verse 30, you will grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. David said in Psalm 141 verse 3, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. And Solomon, David's son, in Proverbs chapter 17, said in verse 28, Even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. But he that shuts his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So if what we're about to say does not bless and benefit the one listening, then the Bible tells us that we should simply keep our mouths shut. And so let us go about day by day as we meet people, as we walk through this world on a daily basis, let us go about striving to leave others with a, a spirit of blessing and joy as we remember that as followers of the Lord Jesus, we are his mouthpiece. We are his spokesman. And so we should, in all our dealings with others, be Jesus unto them. Well, friends, I pray that your journey will be blessed as you strive each day to serve the King, the Lord Jesus, faithfully and that you'll continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, and that you will learn to love him both passionately and intimately. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.